Yeah. Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, lecture on Byzantium and the steps in the 6th to 7th centuries, which will focus on the relations between Byzantium, the Avars, the Turks, and also partly the Bulgars. My name is Johannes Preiser Capella. I'm working at the Institute for Medieval Research, the Division for Byzantine Research of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And one of my main research topics uh, is the global history of Byzantium and the connection between Byzantium and the wider Eurasian world throughout the Byzantine millennium. So we will deal mainly with uh, the developments in the from the mid 6th to the late 7th century, which is a period of decisive change across the steppes and also the empires of Afro-Eurasia. Of course, in the steppes, we see the emergence of new formations like the ones of the Turks, the Avars, the Bulgarians, the Khazars. But we also see uh, the migrations of other uh, groups, of course, the Arabs, but also the Slavs in Eastern, Southeastern Europe, and also the emergence of new empires like the Empire of the Tang or later also of the Tibetan Empire. In order to understand the, the developments across Afro-Eurasia, we also have to take a look on developments in the eastern part, so at the borders to China, which then also affect developments more to the west. Uh, China, since the 4th century, was divided politically. Uh, there is a continuation of, so one could say, Chinese dynasties in the south, whereas the north was politically fragmented. Various dynasties, or one could even say warlords of various ethnic backgrounds, tried to establish empires or polities uh, in the northern Chinese region, most of them short living. Only the Tuba or Tapgach, an ethnic group from north of China, was able to establish a more durable dynasty, the Wai or Northern Wai dynasty, uh, from the late 4th uh, to the early 5th, uh, 6th century and they established what has been called the hybrid empire. So they, at the one side, maintained steppe traditions, um, also in the performance of their rule as the Khan over the steppe part of the empire, of the traditional Turba or Tapgach parts of their realm, whereas in the Chinese provinces they tried to, to establish themselves as Chinese style rulers, as Chinese emperors. For instance, also, they supported very much the uh, uh, grow, growing power of the Buddhist cult, which since the first century CE had made its way into China. And uh, originally the uh, residence was, one could say, at the frontier region between the sedentary provinces and the steppe in uh, Pingcheng, where also thousands or tens of thousands of, of people from other parts of northern China were re relocated to support uh, economically and demographically this new center. Um, and at the same time, we see in the steps to the north in modern day Mongolia, the establishment of uh, the realm or the empire of the Ruran, which has been called the shadow empire of the Turba. So the idea emerges from studies over the, one could say, symbiotic uh, emergence of, of empires in China, when China was politically united or where there were larger political formations and as a shadow, also larger, larger formations emerged in the steps to the north. So for instance, already in the third century CE, when China was for the first time politically united, you see the emergence of the Xiongnu Empire. And for the Turba, the Ruran were somehow their shadow empire. Uh, this hybrid model of, 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 of the Turba Wai Empire came to an end in the late uh, 5th century, symbolically also, symbolically also when the residence was relocated from the north to Luoyang, one of the traditional Chinese capitals. This also had logistic grounds, but also marked a change in the politics of the empires of the Turba Wai Empire, when, which, who, who now were trying to be more, more focused on Chinese traditions. This, to a certain extent, alienated traditional Turba elements of, 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 of their realm, which then eventually led to uprisings, rebellions, civil wars, and eventually a division of the Turba Wai uh, in, from the five, five 530s onwards. There were now two competing 
uh, empires in the north and of course profiting from this were the Ruran, who for some decades now were really able to establish themselves as a predominant power in the steppes of Eastern Asia and also able to exert tribute payments from this fragmented uh, Northern Wai uh, policy. Um, this peak period of the Ruran can be dated to the, to the reign of Khan Anakwei between 524 and 552, but he is also the, the last Khan of the Ruran because towards the end of, of, his, of his rule, he came into conflict with a group which before that was a vassal of the Ruran, and these are the Turks or the Gök Turks, a Turkish speaking group who under Bumin then uh, challenged and eventually, eventually defeated the Ruran and the Ruran Empire came to an end in the 550s. Uh, the dynasty now of the Gök Turks, the Ashina, we will talk about the, the, the origin of these names uh, in a few minutes, was able to establish themselves as supreme power in the Eurasian steppes um, from China all the way to the Caspian Sea. Uh, it was one empire, but also for, one could say, for, for logistical reasons, there were actually there was one supreme Khan in the east, but also a western Khanate uh, under a, a junior uh, a member of, of the ruling dynasty. So we have Mukan Kagan in the east and Ishtemi in the west. Um, and this Khanate now was also able to exert tribute payments from the neighboring Chinese empires who were still uh, fragmented, especially silks and other precious goods. And now the idea was also to, to trade these silk uh, to the West to gain additional profits from the tributes ex exerted from China. But this is the emergence of a first Turkic empire in the Eurasian realm in this period. Uh, the central region of this empire can be located in the area of the rivers Selenge and especially Orkhon, so in, in what is now Mongolia. Um, and this area then became known also in these texts. Uh, so we have also then the, the emergence of, 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 of inscriptions in, in a runic uh, alphabet in this Ochon region. And from these uh, texts, we also know that this region was called Ötikan, um, which became also then somehow had uh, loaded with religious implications. So this was, was also the divinely ordained homeland or central area of Turkic rule in this wider empire. And these alphabet, uh, so these texts are very precious because we get the rare opportunity to also read the from within perspective of such a step empire. Otherwise, of course, we're mostly relying on the sources, the written sources of the neighboring sedentary empires. Here we also have a perspective from within the steppe empires. Uh, the Gök Türk, the name is such, Gök in all Turkish means blue or from heaven. So this is, has of course, also religious implications so that this was divinely ordained that this group would now rule over the steppes. And the ruling dynasty was called the Ashina. And there are various theories about the origin of this name. One quite common one is that it has, it is, it is emerged from, from an Indo-European Iranian language also meaning blue or from heaven, there's even the idea that the ruling uh, family, uh, this, uh, the Ashina, Ashina had an Indo-European origin, but this is uh, very much uh, contested. Uh, but the name as such may have derived from an Indo-European language. The Turks, especially now the Western Turks, came also in contact with the Sasanian Empire. So we were one of the predominant powers in Western uh, Asia. And the Sasanians had had a long and complex uh, history with the Heftalites, or sometimes called the White uh, the White Hans, uh, who had emerged as predominant power in uh, Western Central Asia, and also somehow in Eastern Iran from the mid uh, fifth century. They had also intermingled into interdynastic fights in the Sasanian Empire, and from some time had also exerted tributes from the Sasanians. And now uh, the Sasanian great king Khusro formed an alliance with the Western Turks under Khan Ishtemi. And together in, in from 557 to 562, in several years of war, they attacked the Heftalites and brought this empire to an end. The Heftalite empire collapsed 
and was divided between the Sasanians and the Western Turks. Uh, but as we will see, uh, this then eventually led also to an actual confrontation well, bet, uh, between the two former allies, as maybe could have been expected. Uh, so the Western Turks now also made their appearance, one could see, on the global geopolitical um, uh, scene in Western Asia or in Western Eurasia. Um, the Sasanians, as such, had a long tradition of, of frontier politics towards the also manifest in the so-called Great Wall of Gorgan to the east of the Caspian Sea, over more than 200 kilometers, a system of walls and, and uh, castles and, 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 and military camps, which can be compared really with, with the equally impressive border constructions of the Roman Empire, the, the Hadrian, Hadrian's Wall, for instance. And in the last years, there have been several survey projects which have really uh, contributed a lot to our knowledge about the system, how it was also uh, built and also lo the logistics behind this, this, this great uh, border control project of the Sasanians. Um, these changes in the Eurasian steppes then had also implications for the westernmost uh, part of this Eurasian steppe belt, so the steppes to the north of the Caspian and the Black Sea all the way to the Danube. And here we have in the fifth, mid 550s, 557, 558, the first appearance of the Avars in the sources of the Roman, or we may call it Byzantine Empire, or as later scholarships calls it, in the late uh, rule of the famous Emperor Justinian I. And the Avars first show up to the north of the Caucasus and they send the delegation to Constantinople and they ask for the permission to cross the Caucasus to enter. Roman, Eastern Roman territory and to get uh, settlement areas in the border regions to the Sasanians. This, of course, is a very delicate border region, so Justinian declines these, these, uh, demand, these demands, but then more or less invites the others to continue their march to the west to deal with the various groups to the north of the Black Sea, which had emerged after the collapse, one could say, of the Hunnic Empire in the mid 5th century. Kutrigurs, Onogurs, who also uh, regularly had been a problem for uh, the Roman frontier and uh, for the Roman Empire. And this, uh, the others then do in the next years with uh, also for Constantinople, uh, surprising success and then more or less show up in the in more delicate uh, hinterland of Constantinople, the Danube, as we will see. Justinian had made uh, considerable efforts to stabilize the Danube frontier. He himself ori come origins from the, from the uh, Balkan provinces of the Roman Empire, uh, and he also established a new town near his birthplace, near uh, modern-day niche in Serbia, uh, which also got his name, so it has been called the, late, the, the last big uh, foundation of a city in antiquity. The city of Justiniana Prima, which now most probably can be identified with the archaeological site of Chalicingrad, where there are very interesting excavations now going on for several years in a collaboration of Serbian scholars and scholars from the Römisch Germanische Zentralmuseum in Mainz. So we have this urban project. And Justinian also established the so called Vestura Exercitus, which was an administrative unit which combined the provinces in the southern Aegean, Crete, the Dodecanese, and also in southwestern Asia Minor, with the provinces at the lower Danube. So the surplus, the taxes, and also uh, other forms of, 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 of uh, surplus production of these areas in the interior of the empire uh, via maritime logistics should supply the uh, often very much devastated provinces at the lower Danube in order to support here uh, Roman rule and also the de de demographic recovery, so that these provinces would become a firm barrier for, for Roman rule in the Balkans again. This was the idea behind this Vestur Exercitus. This is a reconstruction of this uh, already mentioned project of the Römisch Gemeinschaft Central Museum together with the Serbian scholars, uh, 3D reconstruction of Justiniana Prima or Charicingrad. The city as such only existed for a few decades uh, until around 615. Uh, this is the same time when all of this uh, Roman Byzantine frontier organization more or less collapsed, as we will see, and also 
these plans of Justinian more or less came to an end in this period. But this, of course, makes it makes it even more interesting because the place as such was never settled again. And this is, of course, a very precious uh, condition for, for the archaeologists. And there are very, very interesting findings over the last years. Uh, around the time, also new groups emerge at the Danube frontier of the Roman Empire. They show up in the sources as Antes, Getes, and especially Sclavinia. So these are Slavic-speaking uh, groups uh, from the 6th century onwards. And of course, this uh, leads us to the question of the origin of the Slavs. And this is, of course, also a long contested question called over the last 200 years. This is this map from the book of Peter Heather, who has mapped here various ideas of proposed Slavic homelands. I would guess you have seen some of these also maybe in your school books during school. Um, one interesting one and re most recent one is the idea of Florin Kurata. Uh, who has uh, established the idea that more or less the ethnogenesis, the formation of the Slavs as a group and the label uh, take place at the region where they first show up at the sources, which is at the Danube frontal region towards the Roman Byzantine Empire. But of course, this has been very much discussed and contested as all other theories. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's 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 an ongoing debate, debate let's, let's say, and of course, it's also connected to modern day as known national um, yeah, disputes and, and so on. Um, for our uh, topic, of course, it's interesting that in the time, in the 530s, 540s, we also have a change of, one could say, nat natural conditions, which uh, very much impede the imperial project of Justinian. Uh, Misha Meyer has called this the other age of Justinian after the say, promising beginnings in the 520s and the 530s. And this can be connected to two phenomena. One is climatic change. So in 536 and also 540, we obviously had uh, big volcanic eruptions, which uh, formed a prelude to a longer period, which has now been called the late antique little ice age. So uh, this uh, significantly colder period in the climatic conditions across afro uh which also contributed to a series of, of, of uh, wet extremes, bad harvests, and maybe also to the outbreak of another phenomenon, which is the so-called Justinianic plague. So an epidemic which uh, first showed up in the Mediterranean in 541, 542, first in Egypt, then also in Constantinople across the entire Mediterranean. And this epidemic returned in, in waves, so in various occurrences over the next 200 years and had uh, a demographic impact, of course, on the empire and also on neighboring polities. The scale of this demographic impact is now very much debated. There's ongoing debate also connected to the recent book of Karl Harper, but also some publications of Leo Mordecai and Merle Eisenberg. So let's say it's, it's again, an, an, an ongoing debate. Um, at least it is clear now that the, the Plague as such was caused by a senior pestis, the plague bacterium, but all other implications, at least in economic and demographic terms, are, are, are under discussion. Uh, one, however, could say that the plague in combination with these climatic impacts for sure did not uh, form an um, advantageous environment for uh, Roman and also Sasanian Persian, for instance, imperial projects. At least this will, this could be say, said, uh, regardless of the actual amount of the demographic. Um, we also hear about such red extremes uh, in combination with the advance of steppe groups. They already mentioned Kutrikus, for instance, here in 595 cross over the frozen Danube and then easily cross over into the territory of the Romans, as we learn here. Uh, but this is only the prelude then to what the Avars will do a few years later. Um, also the Carpathian Basin, so the, the western part of the Danube frontier from the Roman perspective, uh, was at that time very much contested. After the collapse of the Hunnic Empire in the five, fifth, uh, 450s, eventually the Gepids, a Germanic group, had been able to establish themselves as predominant power in the Carpathian Basin. They had also been able to take over the Roman uh, frontier city of Sirmium, uh, which had become more or less the residence of the Gepids. Uh, but they also had to compete increasingly in the 6th century with another Germanic group, 
which had settled uh, in Western Hungary, eastern parts of what is now Austria, also parts of, of Slo Slovakia and, and Moravia. And these are the Longobards or Lombards. And they were in a constant struggle, one could see with the Gepids. And Constantinople, say, behind the scenes was also trying to play out these groups against each other to take, uh, to have their own advantage from it. On this scene now, the Abbas showed up in, 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 in the late, uh, mid five, five, late 560s. Um, and they formed an alliance with the Lombards and together the Longobards and the Abbas, uh, attacked the Gepids. Uh, the Gepids tried to, to get support from Constantinople. But uh, Constantinople declined this, this plea for help and used the situation to gain back Sirmium, this important frontier city, uh, via the rest of the Gepid Empire now collapsed and uh, came now under our rule. Since the majority of the Lombards under the King Alboin, and this was the first short term disadvantage the, the Byzantines had from not supporting the Gepids, one could say, was that the Lombards now decided to cross over the Alps into Italy which just a few years before had been reconquered or conquered from Constantinople from the uh, Orthogoth and this only really still rather fragile Byzantine Roman control now was 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 put into question by the Lombards which which very quickly took over especially large parts of, of northern Italy and the others now themselves established themselves in the Carpathian Basin one could say also as heirs to the Huns who had done so uh, 150 years before, and now even more closely to the heartland of Constantinople, had established themselves as a, say, dynamic steppe empire. Uh, the question is, what is the origin of the Avars? Uh, we have talked about the Ruran, and we hear from Byzantine sources that later Turks, with whom the Byzantines got into diplomatic contact, we will uh, talk about this in a few minutes, claimed that the Avars were descendants of refugees, of groups the Turks had defeated. Um, they also can call them the pseudo avars in some sources they are also called the Varchonites. Um, and this has led to some ideas that the Avars were remaining elements of the Ruran formation in the steppes. Um, actually, the archaeological evidence to a certain extent uh, supports the idea that the Abbas also had connections to the far east, one could say, of the steppes. Another possibility is also that some elements of the Heftalites, who were also, the empire was also destroyed by the Western Turks in uh, alliance with the Sasanians, uh, more or less became part of this new formation, which we now know under the na name of Avas. And there are also some links or linkages have been made due to the material culture, uh, which shows now up in the Carpathian Basin, also to the north of the Black Sea, which is connected to the Avas, that we have here also some elements of the Heftalites. All of this, of course, is hypothetical or, or is also debated, but there is some, some indication that uh, we have here connection to various groups which were, say, at the losing side of these dynamics in the steppes and then made it to the West and formed this new group, which now shows up. As in the Carpathian Basin at this time, we also have some paleo-environmental indications that we see here the same um, less advantageous conditions, at least for agricultural um, uh, economics. Uh, as in the rest of Afro-Eurasia connected to this late antique Little Ice Age, so it's a, it's a very, the 6th century is a very cold and also dry period, as far as we can reconstruct it from the paleogenetic, uh, paleo-environmental uh, proxies. I only refer to this paper I have published uh, two years ago, The Climate of the Kagan, Observations on Paleo-Environmental Factors of the History of the Avars, and you can also download it for free on the internet via this link. Um, and there you can read more about this. What we can see is that the Avars were able to establish themselves, especially also in the area between the uh, rivers Danube and Tissa. And uh, at the same time, we're also able to take over, say, some est established structures and also settlements, which had existed also in continuity from late antiquity. And uh, we also see that the Avars obviously for some decades maintained some supreme power in the Pontic steppes to the north of the Black Sea. Uh, we will see that this ends in the uh, 620s, 630s. And they also maintain some continuities or, or allow for some continuities. 
And this can be especially connected to the site of, of Kestilifenik Pushta near Lake Palato. This is a very this is a very interesting site, Kestilifenik Pushta. Uh, it's um, say late Roman fortified settlement, which existed from the late Roman period all the way to the early seventh century. So we have a continuity of settlement. You also see here remains of, for instance, Christian churches. So this is also a Christian community. And we have a continuity also of agriculture in the late antique tradition. So this was really a settlement which was also able to arrange itself, obviously with new lords, with the Gapids, but also now with the Abbas. And one could say also provided interesting elements of continuity, economic continuity, skills, whatever, which were also to the advantage of the new overlords of the region. So here we have really continuity up, up to the late early 7th century. Uh, which also somehow uh, yeah, relativizes this, this additional idea of, of dark ages and, 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 and equally interesting is also the technological transfer uh, which the Abbas brought, at least as far as we can reconstruct, and which has especially been uh, connected to the uh, invention of the stirrup. Uh, which emerged in the steppes or in Eastern Asia already in the fourth or fifth, fourth, fifth century. And now obviously with the Avas made it to the Western steppes and also to Europe. And we see this in a text uh, which uh, was only written only a few decades after the Avas show up, the so-called Strategicon of Mauritius. So it's attributed to the general and later emperor Mauritius. And here's a description of the equestrian equipment of the Roman armies. And at that time already the Byzantine Roman armies had uh, adapted elements of the Ava armament. So we see this in this text, various elements of the armament, also of the of the armament of the horses um, are taken over by the Avas, and this is also made explicit here. And this also includes the stirrups, which now become element of, of the equipment also of, of Byzantine cavalry and other cavalry forces uh, in, in the European rich region. Um, at the same time, where, when the Abbas were starting to establish themselves in the Carpathian Basin, uh, even bigger uh, conflicts uh, started to re-emerge. Within this, one could say at this time, traditional enmity between the superpowers in Western uh, uh, Eurasia, which are the Roman, Eastern Roman Byzantine Empire and the Sasanian Persian Empire. They already had fought several wars in the decades before. Uh, the last war had only ended a few years before in 562, and now Justin II, the nephew and successor of Justinian, uh, didn't want to continue the tribute payments uh, this earlier peace had included, and he was looking for allies. And he now found these allies in this newly emerging power in the steppes, which is the Turkish or West Western Turkish Khanate. Uh, as we have seen, this Turkish Canada originally had been an ally of the Sasanians. Together they had destroyed the Heftalite Empire. But now they came into conflict, uh, uh, first of, of, uh, because also of, of mercantile uh, yeah, politics. As we have seen, the Turks uh, extracted a lot of tribute in the form of silks from the Chinese polities. And now the, this uh, silk, uh, they wanted to, to trade to the West. And for this, they have especially also used as intermediaries the Soktians. The Soktians uh, is uh, the Soktians. Soktia was was uh, was a, a traditional uh, center of trade since the fourth century CE, located between Persia and China. One could say uh, also uh, establishing colonies and and, and 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 trade networks across this entire region. Um, and uh, located around famous city like Samarkand and Bukhara. And the Soktians now integrated also in the Turkish Khanate and became, one could say, also their mercantile advisors. And originally the plan was to, to trade uh, this uh, silk with the Sasanian Empire. So Turkish delegation showed up at the court of the great, great King Khusro uh, and demanded that the Sasanians should open their markets for, for the silk. This, however, was rejected, and we even hear in the source that uh, the Sasanian great king uh, 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 bought the silk from this delegation, but then uh, put it to fire symbolically to, symbolically to show them that he would not allow for them to trade freely across his realm. 
And so the Sopkins came up with an alternative idea and they sent a delegation or the Turkish sent a delegation under the uh, leadership of some, some Sopkins to Constantinople. And this not uh, only led to the establishment of mercantile collect, uh, connections, but also uh, to an alliance. So Emperor Justin II now formed an alliance with the Western Turkish Khanate against the Sasanian. Um, also, already before, there had been some connections. So we also see, for instance, imitations of Byzantine gold coins all the way to China. And to the left, you see also a, a Chinese depiction of a Soktian trader on a Bactrian camel. So the Soktians were also well known in Chinese sources as, as very skilled traders. And many of them also made a career in the Chinese empires already in the 4th, 5th, 6th century. So they formed really also a diaspora community in the, in the Chinese empire. And now also obviously, obviously, obviously such a community was also formed in Constantinople. So these delegations included around 120 Soktian traders as we'll, as we'll learn. And the Byzantine Emperor, uh, Justin II, now sent a delegation back to the Western Turkish Khan uh, under the leadership of Tsemakos, so a high-ranking court official. And he, he traveled all the way to uh, Sitsabulus, as he is called. This is the Turkish t t t title, Sir Yap Yapku, Ishtemi on the Ektak, the golden called in the Greek sources. We have this written down in Menanda Protector. And here, We'll also read about how then this delegation was received by the Turks and officially now the new uh, the two empires acknowledged its, uh, each other more or less as equals and formed an alliance against the Sasanians. And on this basis now Justin II uh, started war again with the Sasanians in the early 570s. Uh, this alliance however had not the effect Justin II had hoped for so the, the the attacks of the Western Turks were not that effective, and the outcome was 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 really a 20-year-long war, which um, destroyed a lot of resources of both empires, and also of course weakened the Roman or Byzantine uh, uh, the Byzantine resources and and their their power also to to counter the other empire formation in the Carpathian Basin. And the others were able to establish not only the empire, but also to expand towards the Byzantine frontier. And this is very much uh, symbolically marked in 582, when then the others were able to uh, conquer Sirmium, this important frontier city, which the uh, Byzantines had only reconquered a uh, few years before when the Gepid Empire had collapsed. And now the others took over this place and this opened also for them the opportunity to uh, making more far-reaching raids into the Byzantine Balkans. So here's the Sirmium. Um, this is also an interesting artifact from the time of siege and conquest of Sirmium. This is a tile which has a Greek inscription, a very, say, peculiar Greek. Uh, and this is uh, more or less a prayer of an inhabitant of Sirmium to God that he may help the city uh, that he may destroy the others and protect the Romania, so the Roman Empire, and the one who has written down this text, which at this time was to no avail because Simeon then was uh, conquered by the others in 582. Uh, in between these five wars between Ava, the others and the, so the raids they made, the, the others and the Romans and the raids they made into the Roman provinces, we also have so for some years always also some, some uh, treaties, which included uh, tribute payments from Constantinople to the others, and with you see also in the statistics that this was also growing. So every every new contract uh, included even higher annual payments in hundreds of kilograms of gold to the others. This gold can also be found in the archaeological evidence. This is from this new book on, of Gandila. I will refer to it also pay, uh, later. And he um, uh, includes this, this map, which, which maps also coinage, find founds of coinage to the north of the Danube from the uh, early Byzantine period, so especially from the 6th century. And you see that we have also a strong concentration of gold coinage. So this would be this, the white the white circles in also what uh, we can is, uh, um, interpret as core area of the Avas between the Danube and the Tissa in the center of the Carpathian Basin. 
another possible artifact of this transfer of gold, but also of skills to the Ava uh, Empire is the famous treasure of uh, Nagashent Miklos, or uh, as the city is now called in Romanian, San Nicolao Mare, which was found in 1799 and then still the uh, Danube monarchy of the Habsburgs. Therefore, you can also find now these objects in the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna. Um, and these are some other famous objects. And the iconography includes elements of the steps, but also of Greek, Byzantine, Roman tradition, but also of Sasanian tradition. Um, and until today, it's very much contested. So when to date this treasure, uh, to whom to attribute this, Avas, Bulgars, of course, again, also somehow connected with also some national uh, infights uh, until today. I only refer to this very new book uh, edited by Falco Daim and his team at the römisch germanische Zentralmuseum on the treasury of, of San Nicola Mare, which also includes uh, amazing uh, new images and detailed analysis of the iconography and also of the material of, of, of this treasury. And this is only the first publication that it continues this, this analysis. And maybe this will, or for sure, this will lead to a totally new uh, findings and also make, will, make, uh, will allow us to make more firm conclusions to how to date and to contextualize this, this famous treasure. Uh, the others, of course, also got into context with the Slavic groups who already before their arrival had got into motion, one could say. And now the other attack on the Roman Byzantine front, the organization allowed the Slavs either in collaboration or under the rule of the others, but also on their own to make him uh, more uh, advances into uh, Southeastern Europe, uh, into the Balkans. Uh, and eventually this would lead to Slavic migrations all the way down to Southern Greece. So uh, also in the interior of the Peloponnese, we see that Slavic groups establish themselves. We can also see this in the archaeological evidence. You see here one example from uh, a burial ground in Arcadia, so in, in, in the inner Med Peloponnese. And the Roman Byzantine control now was mostly confined to, to, the, to the, the, the coastal areas and places like Monemvasia. Uh, which due to their also special uh, uh, defense position, as you can see here, allowed for a maintenance of, of control and of these bases uh, via the interior of, of these, these areas was very much lost in their political control. Um, this context, we also have to refer for a long, or still, again, a long, uh, long tradition of also national and nationalist debates the very provocative uh, uh, hypothesis of Jakob Philipp Fallmereyer, who was a scholar of the Byzantine Empire and of Southeastern Europe in the early 19th century, of Southern Tyrolean origin, then Professor Munich, uh, also traveling a lot in, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean. He also left his name in this Egyptian, um, uh, Egyptian temple, uh, which of course is not very, uh, yeah, shows a more barbarian, um, one could say, approach to, to the heritage of the past. But he, for instance, claimed that uh, due to this Slavonic migration, more or less the ancient tradition, the Hellenic people have been exterminated and that in the uh, Christian population of today's Greece, there would be no drop of noble and unmixed Hellenic blood. But of course, the Philhellenes of the time were looking for the descendants of Achill and of, of of Pericles, um, and at the other time, aside the emerging Greek state in the War of Independence, uh, was of, of course also trying to, to, to get profit from this tradition, to get the sympathies of the West in support against the Ottomans. And therefore, of course, this, this thesis of Falmaria in the newly emerging and young Greek state, and until today, uh, were uh, to say not very popular, to say, to say the least. And of course, this is, to, from a today's perspective, of course, all these ideas of the tradition of racial continuity and, and blood and whatever uh, seem very outdated. But of course, then and even now can arise a lot of uh, yeah, uh, yeah, emotion, one could say. 
another important source for the advance or the establishment of Slavic groups in, in, in the southern Balkans and also in, in Greece are the Miracula Sancti Dimitri. So the city of, of Thessaloniki several times was attacked by Avars and also Slavic groups in the 6th and 7th century, uh, but never conquered. And this was attributed to the, the the, the power of the city saint, Saint Demetrius, who is also depicted here in a mosaic from the 7th century. Um, and this miraculously also tells us about then the more or less permanent establishment of various Slavic groups in the hinterland of Thessaloniki. So Thessaloniki also became an island at the coast of Roman Byzantine control, whereas the hinterland very much was uh, under the control of various Slavic groups. Um, in the 590s, however, there seemed to have been an opportunity for the Roman or Byzantine Empire to re-establish the control over the Balkans. In 590-591, Mauritius was able to, to successfully end the war with the Sasanians. After they had, uh, there had been a civil war in the Sasanian Empire, he supported uh, one could say a legitimate candidate to the throne, Khusro II, and in exchange the he was able to conclude a very advantageous peace treaty with the Sasanians, and this allowed him to transfer troops now from the east to the Balkans, also including some Armenian uh, soldiers which were recruited in Armenia, which was now then under the main control of, of the Byzantines. And with these troops, over several years, uh, Mauritius tried to defeat both the Slavs and the Avars. We also learned from the Strategicon of Mauritius that this included warfare in winter, where it was easier to follow the traces of uh, the very mobile Slavic groups. So the troops had to fight also north to the Danube in winter, and they were also able to advance into the core area of the Avars. And we hear, for instance, from the historian Theophilus de Simocates, that this even led to larger scale defections of followers of the Avar Khan. So the Avar Empire seemed at the, the, the fringe of collapse, one could say. Um, however, this warfare was very demanding of the troops, uh, especially also that they should uh, remain also during winter in the areas to the north. And at the same time, these areas had been plundered and very much desettled uh, in the decades before. So there was also not very much of, of a booty uh, of, of, of looting to make uh, in contrast to the, to the campaigns in the east. And this made this warfare increasingly unpopular among the troops until then in 602, a rebellion broke out and the troops marched to Constantinople, um, killed and slaughtered Mauritius and his family and made one of their officers Phocas uh, emperor in 602. So Phocas now ruled over the Roman Empire. And this uh, allowed uh, Husu II, the Sassanian great king who had been an ally of, of Mauritius, who was killed now, to reopen war again. So under the reign of Phocas, who then in 610 uh, was uh, himself killed and replaced by Heraclius, a Byzantine soldier or officer from, uh, who, whose father had been Exarchos or, or governor in North Africa. Um, this allowed Khuso II to open a devastating war against the Roman Empire and over the next years to advance to Syria, to uh, the Holy Land. So in 614, even Jerusalem was captured and then eventually even to conquer Egypt, which, which was really much, very much threatening the very, very existence of the Roman Empire. And these troops even advanced to Asia Minor all the way to Constantinople. And of this situation also the others tried to take advantage. In 623, they even tried to capture Emperor Heraclius himself, whoever was able to escape. And then later when Heraclius was trying to fight the Persians in the east, in summer 626, they made an advance directly onto Constantinople. So this was the idea really to conquer this center and more or less, one could say, the richest place which was open also for potential plunder in this, in this summer campaign of 626. Um, so the city now was uh, threatened from two sides because the Persian army had advanced all the way to the Bosporus and the others now arrived from the west. However, the two armies, although they were able to get in contact, were not able to, uh, to unite the forces because the Byzantine uh, uh, fleet was still able to, to control the sea. And so the, the Persians were never, never able to directly really help the others in the attack on Constantinople. 
the Khan of the Avars was aware that he had to conquer the city very quickly because his uh, huge number of troops, the sources tell us about 80,000 uh, men, um, even a fraction of this would have been very hard to supply. Uh, so he would need to strike uh, quickly and, and, and hard really to, to with his full force to conquer and storm the city. And this the others now tried. They mainly attacked the area of the Blachernai, uh, which is to the northwest of Constantinople, and which at this time was not, not as fully fortified as other areas of the city. So here the others tried to, to break through. And at the same time, their Slavic uh, auxiliary troops uh, tried to get over the Golden Horde with the help of the so-called Monoxila, so very easy forms of boats made from one tree uh, to attack the, the seaside of the city. However, after one week of very severe fighting, uh, the Slavs were defeated by the Byzantine fleet and the others then also had to give up after heavy, heavy losses, uh, the storming. And so this was to no avail. It was not possible to get into the city and the Khan eventually had to give up the siege, which of course was a heavy blow to his authority, as we will see also in a minute. The Romans or Byzantines attributed the, the salvation of the city to the help of the Mother of God, whose cult had already become popular in the 150 years before, but not much, more, much more intensified. And on that occasion also there was uh, created a new hymn to the mother of God, the Akathithos hymn, Akathithos meaning that it is sung, sung when people are standing, and it includes this text, and this te is still uh, used in the Orthodox Church until today. And, uh, the, uh, This was the end of this uh, other attempt to capture Constantinople. Around that time, Emperor Her Heraclius was fighting in the east against the Sasanian troops, and he was e able to outmaneuver them, especially through some very daring campaigns in the Caucasus, and he was also able to reactivate the alliance with the Western Turkish Khanate. Um, and this time, the Turkish help was more effective, one could say. So the Turks now were operating across the Caucasus. Together with the Romans, they laid siege to the Georgian capital of Tbilisi, which was conquered. They also helped the Romans to, to fight their way into northern Mesopotamia. And Turkish troops also devastated the area of, of Caucasian Albania and of Azerbaijan. And uh, brought very, very big uh, um, damage also to, to these Persian provinces. So they contributed, one could say, to the eventual defeat of the Sasanians. Uh, Husro II then was uh, murdered in a palace coup after it was clear that the war was lost. His son took over and then eventually peace was established, re-established between the Romans and the Persians. However, two em the two emperors were very much weakened by this uh, second almost 30-year war in, in, within two generations. 
eventually especially then to the benefit of the emerging Islamic community under, um, uh, under Prophet Muhammad and his, his Interestingly, in the same year as the Abbas were laying siege to Constantinople, also the Chinese capital of Chang'an was uh, threatened by an army from the steppes. And this is also one scene uh, contrasting these two stamped empires in the book of Walter Pohl, I will refer to later. Um, in China, towards the end of the 6th century, a process of political reunification had taken place. So the Sui dynasty was able to establish themselves first in northern China to reunite the northern Chinese empire, one could say the former Tuo Bavai empire, and then also under Emperor Sui Wendi to conquer the south, so China was politically reunited. This was, one could say, to the disadvantage of the Turks, which now were, were facing a strong Chinese united empire. However, the rule of the Sui dynasty was short-living, the successor of, of Emperor Sui uh, undertook some very costly campaigns also to Korea and together with his building board projects, a big canal project, a building a second capital, all this led to social upheaval and eventually civil wars. So the political uh, unification was short living first and only then in the 620s the new dynasty of the Tang was able to establish themselves as a new unifying power and and uh, the imperial Chinese dynasty. Um, and this period of, of, of a weakening of the Chinese side of the frontier, the Turks used in 626 to advance all the way near the Chinese capital of Chang'an and only after the payment of heavy tributes they returned. However, this was one could say the last big success of the Eastern Turkish Khanate because only a few years later, the Chinese uh, under the Emperor Taizong were able now to advance into the steppes and to conquer the Eastern Turkish Khanate. So only a few years later, the Eastern Turkish Khanate collapsed. In retrospective, and this is an inscription from the time of the Second Turkish Empire, so after the Turks, the Eastern Turks were able to regain independence from the Chinese in the 8th century, in retrospection this was uh, attributed to, say, the weak qualities of the successors of the First Khanates, so that the younger brothers and the sons did not resemble their ancestors, but of course also Chinese intrigue brought about this unity and eventually this led uh, that the Turks became slaves uh, of the Chinese people. Uh, another interesting background to this development has been uh, discussed by Nicola Di Cosmo and his colleagues in an article a few years ago, where they used uh, again paleoenvironmental data to show that this was again another peak period of this later thick little ice age. Uh, we have also in the Chinese sources indications that there was a series of severe winters which killed a lot of, of, of the animals, of the herds of the Turks, so the economic basis was weakened. And these may have contributed or for sure contributed also to the weakening of power in fighting civil wars and eventually uh, political collapse of this Turkish Khanate around 630. Um, Emperor Taizong himself now tried to present himself not only as Chinese emperor but also as Khan and he claimed that he would love both the Chinese and the barbarians in the same way that he would now rule not only over the sedentary Chinese core but also over the steppes and he himself was also well known as, 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 a, as a horseman his favorite horses are even depicted on his mausoleum so one could say also this a uh, hybrid culture which had, had emerged in the north, northern China since the 4th century, also due to the heritage of the new groups in, integrating into the Chinese tradition, also led to the emergence of, 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 a, of a horse culture, horsemanship, also aristocratic culture, which, were, which was also uh, more easily to connect with the traditions of the steppe and then allowed also the Tang for some time also to create a unified empire of China and of the steppes. Um, later Chinese uh, uh, commentaries, and this is from a Chinese history of the 11th century, of, uh, however, uh, claimed that the Tang more or less uh, were following a way of imperial overstretch, that they tried to swallow the peoples in all four directions, and not only they conquered the Eastern Turkish Khanate, but in the 650s they even advanced 
even more far to the west and also conquered the western Turkish Khanate. So both Turkish Khanates were eventually destroyed by Chinese forces uh, between 630 and 660. This is also a time where we see a crisis of the Aba Empire. So the defeat before the walls of Constantinople in 626 had weakened the authority of the Khan. And then we hear that there was also civil war and rebellions in the Ava realm. Even before 626, the westernmost parts, uh, so uh, at the Danube around modern day Austria, but especially also to the north in modern day Bohemia and Moravia, there was the core of the emergence of an independent power formation of various Slavic groups who had settled there under the leadership of a merchant who had come from the Frankish Empire, Samo. And Samo now could use this weakening of our authority to establish an independent um, yeah, polity or political formation during his lifetime. So it very quickly collapsed after his death in 659. But for some decades, the Avars lost control over these more Western territories of their former empire. Uh, the civil wars obviously also led to devastations and to destructions of, of settlement. Uh, for instance, also Kestli Fenik Bushta, this uh, mentioned settlement of late antique tradition uh, at Lake Balaton, there the settlement ends in 630. So obviously this tradition ended in this turbulent period. Uh, by the 660s or end of, towards the end of 7th century, however, the Ava realm was restabilized to a certain extent. And we even have now indications from the archaeological evidence of settlement expansion. The settlement expansion is uh, more an expansion of agricultural settlements. So we may have also now a change from, say, a more steppe uh, tradition in the form of a steppe empire, depending also of constant expansion and the extraction of tribute from the Romans, which not longer was arriving. So, so after 626, there was no longer any possibilities of the Avars to exert tribute from the Romans. So we have now maybe a no, new power formation or a new basis of power on the basis of settlement intensification and also agricultural settlement, especially also in the fringe areas of the Ava uh, control territory. And this Ava control territory where we have indications of settlement um, expansion also includes uh, modern day Austria. Lower Austria and the region around Vienna, where we also have other findings in various places, Mistelbach, Leobersdorf, and especially this, this uh, piece from the Goldene Stiege, which is a burial ground at this place of Mödling to the southwest of Vienna. So, so here we have settlement expansion from the late 7th century onwards, and we see the same, uh, for instance, in the areas to the Vojvodina, modern day Serbia, or modern day Slovakia. So, especially these areas. Uh, had a growth period uh, from that period onward. However, the Avars lost their control uh, over the Pontic steppes to the north of the Black Sea. So after the arrival in the mid 6th century, for some time, they obviously had also exerted some hegemony there. This uh, came to an end after 630, so after also the defeat uh, at Constantinople. And we, we see this in the emergence of new power formations, especially of the so-called Greater Bulgarian Empire, which now for some time controlled the steps to the north of the Black Sea. And we also hear about two rulers, Organa and Kuvrat. And especially Kuvrat is also uh, prominent in Byzantine sources. He became an ally of the Byzantines. And uh, most probably also his grave has been uh, discovered in Malaya Perish Cepina. Uh, you see this uh, yeah, located on the map. And there we have a series of findings. On the one hand, we see here again this combination, as we also have seen in the, 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 the treasury of Nagish and Miklash, of various uh, cultural influences across Eurasia. So we have Byzantine gold, Byzantine style, we have Sasanian Persian style, Iranian traditions, steppe traditions, but also objects which lead all the way to Chinese traditions. For instance, the sword, which can be uh, very much compared to the sword from a burial ground of the Sui dynasty from the late 6th century. But we also have firm indications that this uh, burial ground can be connected to Kuvrat. And we know also from Byzantine sources that he was also uh, rewarded with the Byzantine title of Patricius, a very high-ranking uh, uh, um, title, 
emerging from the Roman Patricius, and uh, this burial ground included these gold rings, which include a monogram in Greek letters, which can be decipher deciphered as Cuvratos Patricios. So we have here uh, relatively firm evidence that this can be connected to this to this prominent ruler. However, after the death of Kuvrat around 660, the Greater Bulgarian Empire collapsed, um, especially due to the attack of another group, which was an heir to the Western Turkish Empire, and these are the Khazars. The Khazars are a Turkish-speaking group, which originally had been part of the Western Turkish Empire. As we have seen around 659, the Western Turkish Khanate to the east of the Caspian Sea or to, in Central Asia was conquered by the Chinese, so their empire collapsed. But the western parts, to the north of the Caspian Sea and also of the Black Sea, the Khazars were able to establish themselves as predominant power. Originally, the core area was in what is now Dagestan, to the north of the Caucasus, west of the Caspian Sea. And in the 660s, they were able to defeat the Bulgarians, uh, which we also read in later Khazar sources, also in these Hebrew letters, later when the Khazars uh, uh, converted to Judaism. Uh, maybe we will make another episode about this. Um, and this led to the collapse of the Bulgarian empires. And now Bulgar groups migrated in their various directions. One, one group also to the north, to the Volga, where we find them until the 12th, 13th century. But several groups, especially to the west. Some were also integrated into the other empire. And we will talk about the group uh, in a minute. Other groups uh, tried to establish now themselves at the lower Danube. Uh, also trying to develop, uh, establish an overlordship of se se several Slavic groups. And of course, this led them into conflict with the uh, Byzantine Empire. And this group, of course, uh, then became famous as the Daniel Bulgars and under their leader Gasparuch, who then in 681 was able to defeat the Byzantines. And we see the establishment of a first treaty between Constantinople and the Bulgars, who were now established as new power uh, at the lower Danube and say one of more, more or less replaced the Avars as the main threat of Constantinople to the north, one could say over the next decades. Of course, the Bulgars also profited that at that time Constantinople had lost its, its richest provinces in Syria and the Holy Land, in Egypt and Northern Africa to the Arabs, who were the main uh, uh, took benefit from the weakening of the Persian and the Roman Empire in the wars we have talked about. So Byzantium now had to defeat, defend itself against the Arabs, uh, who also tried really to, to attack Constantinople directly. Um, and so the Bulgars also could profit from the weakening of Byzantium. Another group uh, with Bulgar connections we also hear about in the determined sources. And this group came from the Ava Empire. Uh, obviously, there around 680, there was also another time of inner fighting or turbulences. And we hear about a group called Sermesiani. Uh, these are obviously descendants of inhabitants of Sirmium, the city the Avars had uh, uh, conquered in 582. And obviously, this group, under this new ethnic term, uh, had maintained some kind or had formed a kind of special identity within the Ava Empire. And this group now left the Ava Empire and migrated to the south under the leadership of a certain Kuva, which sounds very similar to Kuv Kuvratos, who was a bull of Bulgarian origin, so obviously is also part of the Bulgars who had uh, migrated to the Ava realm. And this group then established itself uh, to the north of Thessaloniki. And uh, then is one of the groups who tried to conquer Thessaloniki. Um, this was to no avail, and obviously then Kuva also was killed in, the, in, in, in this effort. But he was succeeded uh, by a leader named Mavros. Uh, and this Mavros then came to an agreement with the Byzantines. And we even have a seal from the time around 685, a few years later, where he uh, calls him again Patericius, so with the same high-ranking title as, as Kuvrat uh, in the Great Bulgarian Empire, and Archon, so leader, of the Sermesiani and the Bulgarians. So we hear the establishment here, the establishment of a new formation at the border region to Byzantine Thessaloniki, uh, which for some time was more or less also acknowledged by Constantinople and uh, 
we see of other Achontes of Slavic groups also in other regions, which were then in a say independent but somehow at least formal subordinates to Constantinople, and Mavros was one of these leaders. Yeah, here you see how this group to the south. Uh, this, however, uh, very much indicates that we are now in the period where Constantinople had definitely lost control over the interior of the Balkan Peninsula. You see now uh, in the map to the right, more or less the islands of the end at the end of the 7th century and on Thessaloniki and other coastal areas where Byzantine authority was still existing, whereas the interior was now under the control over Sla various Slavic groups and uh, the overlordship over these Slavic groups now was contested between the Bulgars and Constantinople. We have now a new constellation in which the Avars definitely were not longer very relevant for the Byzantines. The Avars as such, but still continued as political entity until the late uh, 8th century, as you know, then were finally defeated by Charlemagne and the Carolingian army, the Frankish army, um, which uh, attacked uh, Ava polity, which was already somehow in fragmentation. We, uh, we, we get the impression that there was already a process of disintegration was going on. Uh, part of the Avars then continued under Carolingian overlordship until 822. This is the last mentioning of an Ava leader in a Carolingian source. Uh, but nevertheless, um, after this very dynamic beginning, the Avars over 230, 40 years were able to maintain a polity, uh, which is much longer, for instance, uh, than the Hunnic Empire, one could say. Uh, so to a certain extent, there were, was a success story of, 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 of a step polity. Um, if we now look at the situation at the end of the period we have discussed in this lecture, we see, of course, how the geopolitical landscape across uh, Eurasia or Afro Eurasia has very much changed. Um, Constantinople or Byzantium now is, is a middle sized polity at the western margins of this larger Eurasian world and under threat from the now new superpower in western Eurasia, which is the Arab uh, Islamic Caliphate at that time still under the dynasty of the Umayyads. Uh, the other, the, then also at that time also expanding towards Central Asia, so also somehow uh, taking over some of the territories which had been under the control of the Heftalites, the Western Turkish Empire, also Soktia, Soktia then, uh, the Soktian cities then at the beginning of the 8th century were included into the Arab realm, but here colliding with the Western expansion of the Tang Dynasty, the other superpower at that time, the Chinese Empire, uh, the two uh, powers then even, uh, came into direct confrontation in the Battle of Talas in 750, 750 when then an Arab army defeated the Chinese army. Uh, so in these big clashes of the superpower, Byzantium now is, say, uh, uh, observer at the margins, one could say, but at the same time also still interacting with the various step formation which emerged over the last uh, decades and centuries at his borders, the Avars, not to, 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 the, to the same extent as before, but now the Bulgars and especially the Khazars, who became also valuable allies against the Arabs. But mainly, we, maybe we will discuss this in, a, in another episode on our channel. So this is this overview I would wanted to give you over these uh, connections between the Byzantium and the steppes and the wider uh, dynamics in the steppes from the mid 6th until the end of the 7th century. Um, in the end, I also would like to recommend some books, uh, which uh, most of them are fortunate in English, if you do not read uh, uh, German or, or other languages. Uh, the one which is really not the standard uh, work on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the topic of the Avars, uh, which is an expanded and very much modified and updated English translation of uh, his book in German is uh, Walter Pohl's The Avars, A Step Empire in Central Europe, 567 to 822, uh, published in 2018, which is really now the main work of reference. However, in the same year, there was also published an updated English translation of an earlier work in modern Greek by Georgios Kadaras, Byzantium and the Avars. So 
especially on the topic we were discussing today, which also gives a very good overview about the political uh, military interaction, but also cultural interaction between the Byzantium and the others. Also after 626. So you also have chapters, uh, what traces we still have about how Byzantium interacted with the others in the later 7th and also in the 8th century. So these are two books I very much recommend also to get into the topic if you're interested in it. Then some more specific topics. One, the book I've mentioned by uh, Andre Gandila, Cultural Encounters on Byzantium's Northern Frontier. Uh, a, a very, very interesting discussion, especially also on the basis of archaeological evidence, uh, also on, on especially of coinage, how this can be used to reconstruct politics, uh, commercial exchange, other aspects of contact between Byzantium, these areas. And also includes a very interesting comparison between the Danube frontier and the Byzantine politics in the Western Caucasus, which is one could say at the west and the east of the Black Sea, so a very interesting study. Then the book I've mentioned, edited by Falco Daim and his colleagues on the treasury of San Nicola Omare, Nagish and Miklos, which with this amazing new photographies and analysis and really opening a new perspective. And then on this, uh, one could say almost legendary siege of Constantinople in 626, also this, uh, the English uh, volume published by Martin Hulbanic, who had start, published two very important books in uh, Slovakian language. But fortunately now we have this English study, which is really an update and, and synthesis of his very interesting and, and, and important studies on this, on this uh, episode, which also had a lot of implications for later Byzantine traditions we have talked about the Akathist or Simons, but in general, uh, on the self-perception also of Byzantium. Yeah, and then two books, maybe if you're interested in the wider global history of the period, uh, into which I am I'm involved. So one is my monograph of 2018, Jenseits von Roman, Karl den Großen, uh, which gives you an overview on aspects of global entanglements between the 4th and the 9th century. Um, and maybe we will be able also to have an English translation uh, in a few months. We are working on this. And then most recently a book I have co-edited with Janis Toritis and Lucian Reinfand, Migration Histories of the Medieval afro region Transition Zone. Uh, and if you enter this title on Google, you will come to a website of Brill. And due to the generous funding of the Austrian Science Fund, uh, and the Moving Byzantium project of Professor Claudia Rapp. This book is open access, so you can download the entire volume for free. And it contains various chapters on aspects of migration history um, from late antiquity to the late medieval period, but also an overview uh, in general of migrations across the steppes and also two contrasting chapters, for instance, also on the Slavic migrations to Southeastern Europe by Florin Kurta, whom I've mentioned, and by Johannes Koda, which also give you an overview about these debates. So, um, and finally, I also would like to mention another project which was started by Walter Pohl this year on the basis of a big ESC synergy grant, which is especially devoted to new paleogenetic research. So an attempt on the basis of hundreds of, of skeletons to, to establish the paleogenetic profile of the various groups who migrated into the Carpathian Basin from the late Roman period to the early medieval period. And this would for sure very much modify what we know about the migrations, the various groups, who, how they are connected to each other. So uh, an amazing project. And you also find an overview uh, on the blog of the Institute for Medieval Research of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. You can also find the slides for this presentation uh, on my Academia Ito account. The link is, is down. You can find it in the text below. And if you have any questions, uh, please send me an email. And otherwise, I thank you very much for your attention.